Hi folks, I'm Adam, your instructor. Welcome to the Laney College Machine Shop. Today, we're going to be working on the Finderscope project for Machine Tech 210, the introductory course in machining and manufacturing. Specifically, we're going to be working on the lower piece of the adjustable altitude azimuth mount. We're going to take this 3 quarter inch by 1 and a quarter inch by 2 and a quarter inch aluminum block and turn it into this part, doing all of the millwork. Before we get started on the machine, let's just take a few moments to review the features on the three-dimensional solid model and the specifications on the drawing. The three-dimensional solid model shows that this part is pretty simple, more or less a rectangular block with two tabs or wings on one side. The part actually starts off as a solid block, and we'll have to remove material to create a step and a slot to create those tabs. We can also see that there are basically three holes, two threaded holes which go down through the main body of the part, and then one hole which goes all the way through the side of one tab and then partially into the other. It's actually really important that the hole does not go all the way through that second tab, because we're going to be putting a little compression spring in there and we want it to be captured. All right. Here's the drawing. Before we jump into the views, let's get a lay of the land. Down in the title block at the bottom right, we can see that the title of the part is Mount Lower. Next to that, on the left, we can see that the material is going to be 6061 T6 aluminum alloy. And the finish is going to be fine bead blast, meaning that the surfaces will be blasted with fine glass bead after machining, which will be discussed in a separate video. Further to the left, you can see the tolerance block, which specifies our standard shop tolerances for the different dimensions on the print where no other tolerance is specified. These are all based on significant digits, so the number of places after the decimal point determines the tolerance of that dimension. We'll also be looking for a standard 125 micro inch finish on all of the surfaces, and we're going to interpret everything on this print according to ASME Y14.5-2018, the most recent standard for print specifications. Okay, looking at the views themselves, we can see that an isometric view of the part has been provided for our reference. It definitely helps in visualizing the three-dimensional part and contextualizing the two-dimensional views on the print. Speaking of, we are given two orthographic projection views, what I would call a front view and a top view. There are a bunch of dimensions which specify the sizes of various sort of square-sided features and the locations of the holes. There are also some special hole notations which specify the sizes, depths, etc. of the features on those holes. There's also a leader line with a note pointing at a region on the Let's call it the top surface of the part, which is outlined with a type of special purpose line called a chain line. This type of line has a thick weight and a dash pattern, which goes long, short, long, short, long, short, etc. Kind of like a center line, but thicker. Chain lines are used to demarcate regions of a part where special instructions apply. You can see that there are actually two such rectangular regions on the top of this part, and if we look at note number three in the general notes, we'll see that these regions will first be bead blasted and then lapped flat. This is a manual process involving abrasives, which is sort of like using sandpaper. After lapping, we'll apply some tape made out of PTFE, more commonly known by its trade name Teflon. It's the same material used on nonstick cookware, and it is slippery stuff indeed. We'll be covering the lapping and taping procedures in a separate video, so for now, I'm going to remove the related information to unclutter the drawing a bit. Let's try to get a sense of the overall dimensions of this part, so we know what we're dealing with. 
it looks like the overall depth of the part is 1 inch 250 thousandths, or an inch and a quarter, and the overall height of the part is 750 thousandths, or 3 quarters of an inch. Both of these dimensions are in parentheses, indicating that they are reference dimensions only and will not need to be inspected. Furthermore, they are also specified as stock dimensions. The raw material we will use for this part is 3 quarters of an inch by 1 and a quarter inch extruded aluminum, and the drawing is telling us we're going to leave these dimensions alone. However, the material will come as a long bar, and we'll need to cut off as much of it as we need on a bandsaw, and then finish that to final dimension on the milling machine. That overall width will be 2 inches 130 thousandths. Notice that this dimension is not in parentheses or labeled stock, because we will need to machine it. In any case, hopefully this helps you get a sense of the size of the rectangular prism you should be imagining in your head. Okay, looking at the dimensions a little closer now, we can see that there is a step in the part, and this has a depth of 380 thousandths. There's also a slot with the same depth. The bottom of the slot and the top of the step are sort of coplanar with one another and form a continuous surface. The width of the slot is 750 thousandths. Looking at the holes, there are two which go down through the top of the part, one at 630 thousandths from the left side and one at 1 inch 380 thousandths from the left side, and both are on center of the part in the 1 inch 250 thousandths depth direction. The holes will have a diameter of 201 thousandths and go all the way through the part. They will also have screw threads, and these are specified as quarter 20 UNC 2B threads. There's also a hole in the side of the tabs. This one is similar to, but a little more complex than, the last two holes. The hole will have a diameter of 201 thousandths, so nothing new there. And it will go all the way through the first tab, but only partially through the second tab. The critical thing here is simply that the hole does not break through the other side of the second tab, as shown here with hidden lines, and for reasons already mentioned. Like the other two holes, this hole will also have the same quarter 20 UNC 2B screw threads, but these will only go through one side meaning only the section of the hole in the first tab. The hole is located 190 thousandths down from the top of the tab, and on center of the tab, left to right, in the 500 thousandths dimension. I don't think I mentioned that width of the tab before. Okay, that's pretty much it for the print. I think we're ready to start making some chips, so let's head out to the shop. The first step is to cut our stock, so go ahead and take a combination square and set it to two and a quarter inches. This is a little over the final dimension on our part. And then we're going to use that as a sort of stop to set the stick out of the stock material in the bandsaw. Tighten it, double check it, and then we'll cut all the way through. Remember that this is the 3 quarter inch by 1 and a quarter inch aluminum rectangular bar, and the specific alloy is 6061T6. It's a very common grade, a little on the harder side than some other aluminum alloys, but still very soft compared to something like steel. It's actually kind of a happy medium, and it's very nice to machine. Go ahead and file off the burrs on the edges so you don't cut yourself or cause issues when clamping the part in the mill vise. And be kind to the next person and also deburr the stock material before you put it back in the rack. Let's gather up some tools. We'll need a half inch high speed steel end mill, a number four high speed steel center drill, a number seven high speed steel twist drill, which has a diameter of 201 thousandths, a half-inch high-speed steel countersink with an included angle of 90 degrees, and finally a quarter-twenty tap. This one is a plug tap with straight flutes, four of them to be exact. All right, we're on to the mill. So go ahead and wipe off the top of the mill table and grab yourself a mill vise. 
They're kind of heavy, by the way. The mill vise has two keys in it, which are supposed to fit into the T slot on the table. This is to help align the mill vise to the machine. Ideally, you want the jaws of the mill vise to be parallel to the X axis or left to right travel of the machine. And the keys just make that a whole heck of a lot easier to do. Go ahead and wipe off the bottom of the vise and the top of the table again. We're really just trying to make sure that we don't get any debris smushed between these two surfaces. Gently lower the vise down onto the table, making sure that the keys slip into those T-slots. And we like to use these little 3D printed trays to hold our tools when we're working. That just goes on the back of the movable jaw on the vise, right on top of the two screws. To hold down the vise, we're going to need some hardware, so grab two each of the following. T-nut, stud, washer, and flange nut. And assemble them in the way that you see here. Slide the T-nut into the T-slot on the table and into the cutout on the mill vise. Do the same to both sides and then sort of hand snug those nuts down. We need to push the vise forward so that those keys contact the back of the T-slot. So go ahead and do that now. And then grab a 7 8 of an inch combination wrench with an open end and a box end. Use that to tighten the nuts on both sides of the vise. Just like that. Nice and tight. We had these wooden table covers made up at the Laney Fab Lab just to uh, protect the table from falling tools. So go ahead and install those on both sides of the vise. And then we need this special vise handle, which fits onto the hex on the end of the screw on the vise. And uh, go ahead and open that up so that we can get our part in there. Here's the material we just cut, clean, deburred, and ready to go. The height of the vise jaws is just under an inch and three quarters. The height of our part is three quarters of an inch, so we need to make up this difference somehow. And in fact, we actually want the part to be sitting a little bit up out of the vise jaws, otherwise we won't be able to get access to the material that we want to remove. So go ahead and wipe off those inside surfaces, and then grab some parallels and wipe those off too. These are inch and three-eighths parallels, by the way. And set those against the two vice jaws. Now when we put our part down on those parallels, it should be sticking up about three-eighths of an inch, just over. Now scooch the part a little bit out of the vise to the left, maybe like a half an inch or so, according to the ruler. And as you're pressing down, tighten the vise. Okay, let's install the tool. I like to lay down a shop towel just to protect against damage should the tool fall out of the spindle. We're going to hold the tool with this work holding device called a collet, an R8 collet specifically with a half inch hole in it. Go ahead and wipe off the taper in the spindle and the outside of the collet and then stick the two together. Then reach up and spin the drawbar a few times to get it started in the collet. Grab the half inch high speed steel end mill and then jam that up into the center of the collet, get the drawbar hand tight, and then go in with a three quarter inch wrench, engage the brake on the left side of the mill head, and then tighten the drawbar and really put some gronk on it. Remove the shop towel and then start cranking on the table to move the tool over to the left side of the part. We're gonna raise the knee now to move the part closer to the tool, so grab the handle, Install that onto the, uh, the crank on the knee, and then start cranking the knee. We basically just want to move the part up to just under the tool. Now pull on the quill lever to move the tool down. Maybe crank the table over a little bit. Hopefully you can see that the point of all this is to get the entire part within the length of the flutes of the end mill. Otherwise, there will be parts that get uncut or parts that will be smushed against a non-cutting part of the tool. Okay, then lock the quill down so it doesn't move. Turn on the spindle and adjust the speed if you need to. I am not going to discuss feeds and speeds in this video because that was the subject of another video. And it's also part of the exercise for you to figure those out on your own. In any case, slowly move the table to push the part into the spinning tool. 
very slowly. We're just trying to do a touch off here. And as soon as you see a chip just like that, you want to stop. Set the X axis on the digital readout to zero. Move the part away from the tool. Then start cranking on the carriage to move the part toward you and position the tool at the start of the cut. Now move the table back into where you touched off plus like 10 thousandths of an inch as a sort of cleanup cut. Go ahead and lock the two table locks. Spray the surface with a little WD-40. Then start feeding the part by hand into the tool. Nice and steady, consistent speed. You can see those chips coming off, looking very nice. Looking like it's cleaning up. I have to stop and make a comment here about the two cutting directions that are possible when cutting with the side of a milling cutter, like we're doing here. If you feed the part against the direction of the cutting flutes, like what's shown here, and which is what we were doing, then this is called conventional milling. However, if you feed the part with the direction of the cutting flutes, like what's shown here, then this is called climb milling. They each have their individual merits. In conventional milling, tool pressure is higher, which sometimes makes the cutting conditions more stable. But in climb milling, because tool pressure is lower, tool deflection is also lower and surface quality is higher. When taking large cuts on manual machines, conventional milling is the safe way to go. But you can totally do a little climb milling on a final pass to get a nicer finish. By the way, this is also a good opportunity to take a closer look at how the milling chips are formed. The flutes on the end mill are helical, kind of like a corkscrew. And so as they come around in the rotation, they shave off a little sliver of the material starting from the bottom to the top. It should be mentioned that this exerts an upward force on the part, making it want to come up out of the vise. And it also exerts a downward force on the end mill, making it want to come down out of the collet. So good, firm clamping on both the part in the vise and the tool in the collet are very important. Okay, unlock the table. And move the part away from the tool, and then move the, uh, basically move the tool back to the start position. Turn off the spindle. And then wipe the chips off of the part and the vise. Loosen the vise and remove the part. Then file off all of those burrs that we just created. Don't be excessive here. We're not trying to make chamfers. We're just trying to break those edges. Wipe off the debris from the part. And also wipe those parallels off. And put the part back in with the other side sticking out of the, the jaws this time. Also about a half inch. Press down and then tighten the vise. Start the spindle, and then we're going to move the part to touch off on the cutter again, just like we did before. Right there. Okay, zero the x-axis. Move to the start of the cut. Move into, yeah, let's take another ten thousandths. Spray the surface with a little WD-40. and Feed across that face. By the way, I didn't show it here, but you should always lock the table when you do these kinds of cuts. Okay, and I'm actually just going to feed right back across that surface right now because I don't want to change the position of the table. Wipe off the part. We're going to use a dial caliper to measure the length of the part, and it looks like it's about 2 inches 215 thousandths. So I'm going to hit the set button on the DRO, hit the x-axis button, and then type in 2 inches, 215 thousandths, minus. Now what we just did was tell the digital readout that when the tool is at this position, it will cut our part to a length of 2 inches, 215 thousandths. Well, all we really need to do from this point on is take successive cuts until we get down to our final dimension, 2 inches, 130 thousandths. But we're not going to do that all in one go. Let's move to 2 inches, 175 thousandths, which will be a cut of 40. Give it a little spray of WD-40 and cut across that surface. Nice and smooth, controllable. I like the way that those chips are coming off. They call that a rooster tail. <laughs> Those are hot, by the way, so watch out. Okay, move back to the start of the cut now. 
And I'm going to move into 2 inches 135 thousandths, which leaves me that 5 thousandths to take as a finish pass. And cut across, just as before. Nice. All right, I dialed in that last 5 thousandths. Sorry I didn't show it. And I'm actually going to take a climb cut, just to show you that it can be done. I often do this on final passes. Looking very nice. Okay, wipe off the part. Take it out and file it to deburr those edges. By the way, it's always a good idea to measure the part before you take it out of the vise just to verify that you nailed your size, but <laughs> I got a little bit excited. Anyway, go ahead and uh, wipe off the debris. Okay, unlock the quill, pull the quill up, and then move the table out of the way. We need enough space to swing a hammer. Clean off the top of the parallels, not just with a brush, but with your fingers to make sure there's really nothing there. And then pop the part down right in the center of the vise. Push down and tighten it. And grab a dead blow hammer or soft faced mallet. Smack the top of the part to make sure that it sits down on the parallels really nicely. They shouldn't be able to move. And then move the part back toward the cutting tool. With the tool over top of the part, slowly bring it down with the quill until it just touches. Be very gentle when you do this. We don't want to chip those edges. Then go ahead and zero the z-axis on the digital readout. Pull the tool up so that you don't drag it along the surface, and then move the part to the left side of the tool. Now move the tool back down to a depth of 380 thousandths, uh, which is going to be our final depth. Turn the spindle on, and then we're going to touch off on the right side of the part. Very, very gently here. We don't want to snag a big chip. There we go. Now zero the x-axis on the DRO, back the part away from the tool, and then move it so that the cutting tool is at the start position for a conventional milling cut. Dial in a cut of 10 thousandths on the digital readout, little WD-40, and then take the cut. It's not going to be a very heavy cut, and it's not going to go all the way down, but this is just to establish a reference surface in this setup. Wipe it all off, and then measure it with a dial caliper. That looks like 2 inches, 118 thousandths. So we'll go into set mode on the digital readout, hit the x-axis button, and then type in 2 inches, 118 thousandths. So right now, the height and width are set, but we still need to find the center in the depth direction. So we're going to move in just so that the tool is behind the part, and then feed the part along the y-axis to touch off the tool. We want a very, very light touch off here, folks. Now we're going to set that as our y-axis zero. Then go ahead and move the part away from the tool, and we're going to basically try to get the tool to the other side of the part, the front side of the part. And we're going to basically do the same thing. Do a very, very light touch off on the front side. Just like that. Now we're going to use a very cool feature of these digital readouts. Go ahead and hit the half button, and then the y-axis button. And what this will do is find the halfway point between where we set our zero and where we just touched off. And that, of course, is going to be the center of the part. Okay, we're ready for our first real cut. So go ahead and move the part so that the tool is at its start position for a conventional milling cut. Our edge was at 2 inches 118 thousandths, right around here. Let's move to 2 inches, which will be a cut of 100 thousandths, which is quite a bit heftier than what we've been taking so far. And actually, you know what, let's move the tool up a little bit, like 10 thousandths. So the z-axis should read about 370. This way we can finish the top surface after roughing. A little WD-40, and away we go! Yeah, that's looking really, really nice. Wow, look at that. Okay. It's really handling that very well. Let's go in another hundred thousandths. One inch, nine hundred. Take that cut. Yeah, it's really happy. <laughs> the tool is really happy with this. 
you know what, this time let's do 200 thousandths. Let's just try it out. Let's see how it goes. 1 inch 700. Take that cut. Okay. <laughs> I don't think I'd push it much more than that. But yeah, that's doing all right. I think that's going to be good. So the next cut at 1 inch 500 feet across. There are, by the way, a few different schools of thought on how you approach removing material like this. You can use a small depth of cut and a large step over, or you can use a large depth of cut and a small step over, which is what we're doing here. I'm definitely a proponent of the latter because it uses more of the milling cutter and not just the tip. Okay, we're at one inch 100 thousandths for this cut. Looking really nice. 900 thousandths, getting closer. 700 thousandths. Okay, this is going to be our second to last cut, so I'm going to feed it into 510 thousandths. And this is going to leave 10 thousandths of an inch for our final cut. All right, I'm going to brush off the part to get those chips out of the way. Move back to the other end of the part that we started on. Move the quill down to our final depth of 380 thousandths of an inch. Spray the part with WD-40, and then start taking cuts on that surface to establish our final depth. And we can use a much larger step over this time because we're only taking such a small depth of cut. Back and forth, back and forth, using a sort of zigzagging motion is pretty common here. Okay, we're cutting across now right next to the shoulder, but not touching it quite yet. Okay, now move into our final dimension of 500 thousandths. And then take the cut. Hopefully you noticed that this is a climb milling operation so that we can establish a really nice surface finish. There we go. Now position the part so that the tool is on the left side and approximately on center. Wipe off all of those chips. And then we're gonna do a final measurement on that 500 thousandths dimension. Looks like it's right on the money. Okay, now move the tool to the y-axis zero, which should be on center of the part in the depth direction. Spray some WD-40, and then we're just gonna drive that sucker through there. <laughs> Send it! <laughs> you know, the tool actually really doesn't like this kind of uh, aggressive, heavy slotting operation. It causes it to sort of uh, pull to one side, but it'll be all right. All right, move back to the start position. And right now the slot is about a half inch wide because that's the size of our tool. And the final dimension is going to be 750 thousand. So I need to take some cuts off of both sides of the slot. So the first one I'm going to do at Y positive 100 thousandths. Spray some WD-40 and then cut straight across. I love the way those chips come off. Okay, and then I'm going to feed to the other side of the slot the same amount, a hundred thousandths. Okay, so we are taking cuts equidistant from the center. Okay, and then take that cut. And notice that we are trying to do conventional milling here for our roughing cuts, right? All right, clean off the chips, and uh, we're going to take a measurement. Using the inside measuring blades of the caliper here, and I'm getting something like 684 thousandths. So we have like 66 thousandths to go, and I'm going to take that equally off of both sides. So hypothetically, that would be a cut of 33 thousandths per side. Another thing we can do here is measure the two tabs and make sure that they measure the same thing, which will tell us that we are actually on center, and that looks pretty good. So I'm going to dial in a cut now of 133 thousandths. And go ahead and take that cut. Yeah, looking pretty good, behaving pretty well. Move over to the other side, the same amount, 133 thousandths in the other direction. And then take that cut too. Looking good. All right, clean off those chips and we're gonna take a final measurement. We should be there. And, yep. Yeah, just like, a maybe one or two thousandths away. That's pretty good. Okay, so now go ahead and drop that part down with the knee. We're gonna switch out tools because it's time to make some holes. Put that shop towel down. 
Engage the spindle brake and then reach up and break the drawbar loose with a three quarter inch wrench. Before you fully loosen it, grab the end mill so it doesn't fall out and use a shop towel or something so you don't cut your fleshy little fingers. Now loosen the drawbar all the way. Sometimes the collet will get stuck in the spindle taper. So if the tool doesn't want to come out, give the drawbar a smack with a dead blow hammer. There we go. Now we can back off the drawbar completely and pull out the collet. Now we're going to install the drill chuck. Clean off the tapers and then jam them together. Tighten the drawbar as before and then get that shop towel out of there. We're going to find the locations of those holes using this tool called an edge finder. It's got this sort of spring-loaded wobbly tip. And I'll show you how to use it. Install it in the drill chuck and tighten that down. Turn it on, no more than a thousand RPM, otherwise that tip might come flying off. And then we're going to slowly move the part to push against the tip, just that reduced diameter tip on the edge finder until you can see that it goes concentric and then it pops out. Right when it pops out, that means that we've found the edge. So go ahead and zero the x-axis on the digital readout and retract the quill. Now we have to make a very important adjustment. We just told the digital readout where the edge of the part is located relative to the surface, the cylindrical surface of the tip of the edge finder. But what we want is to find the edge of the part relative to the center of the spindle's rotational axis, the center of the edge finder. So we need to move over half the diameter, or the radius, of the tip of the edge finder, which just happens to be 200 thousandths, so 100 thousandths. And that's what it should look like. Go ahead and zero the x-axis right here. This is our edge. Okay, now we're going to touch the front and back of the part to find center. And I realize that we already did this with the end mill earlier, but it doesn't hurt to double check with the edge finder. So go ahead and touch off the back until it pops out. And then we're going to set that as zero on the y-axis. Then we're going to go and touch off on the front. Same thing, drop the edge finder, push it in until it goes uh, concentric and then pops out like that. Now we're going to use that same trick that we used before. So hit the half button and then the Y axis button and then move to the Y axis zero. From there, we're going to move to the first hole location, which is at 630 thousandths. And we're going to install a number four center drill to spot the hole location. A little WD-40. And then we're going to drive that tool in there with the quill just a little bit, just to make a mark for the drill to follow. Okay, this is the drill. This is a number seven drill with a diameter of 201 thousandths. Okay, and then drill all the way through. And you can see that I'm pecking here. I'm going down a little bit, then retracting, just to break the chip. Go ahead and clear those chips. And then it's time for the half inch countersink that has an included angle of 90 degrees. With this tool, we're just gonna cut a little cone at the mouth of the hole, sort of like a chamfer. Don't cut this feature too big. The diameter at the top of the hole only needs to be a little bit bigger than the major diameter of the threads that we're going to tap into this hole. That would be a quarter inch, so a diameter of 280 thousandths, 30 thousandths more, should be plenty. I'll show you how I measure that on the next hole. And then move to our next location, which is one inch, 380 thousandths, right there. And then we're going to do exactly the same thing again. First comes the center drill to spot the hole. Then we're going to drill through. And then the countersink. And this is how I measure that. Just using dial calipers, adjust the jaws so that they are reading across the largest part of that conical enlargement. And here it says 280 thousandths, about. And that's plenty good for us. All right, remove the countersink. And now we need to drop the table a lot, basically all the way to the bottom, because we have to fit a lot of tools in between the part and the drill chuck. Let me show you. First, we need this thing called a spring-loaded tap guide. That goes into the drill chuck. Then we need the quarter-twenty tap. 
And we're going to hold that and drive it into the hole using a tap wrench. It has these sort of V-shaped jaws in it. And those grab onto the square drive on the end of the tap, not onto the round section. Go ahead and tighten that real good. Then that goes into the hole, and you should preload the spring on the tap guide and the divot on the top of the tap wrench to keep everything nice and straight. Apply some WD-40, then just start cranking away. And what you're basically doing here, a tap is like a hardened screw that has flutes cut into it. And so as you assemble it into the hole, it will simultaneously cut the threads. Now you'll notice that I'm doing a couple of things. I'm backing the tap wrench every half turn, quarter turn, something like that to break the chips so that they don't jam up inside of the flutes. Uh, and I'm also adjusting the quill to keep a little bit of a preload on the spring on the tap guide. See? If you don't do that, then it kind of goes floppy. Anyway, when you don't feel any back pressure anymore, then you know that you're through the hole, and just go ahead and back out the tap wrench. Okay, and then move back to the position of the first hole, which, if you'll remember, was at 630 thousandths of an inch. And then it's just more of the same. You are going to tap a lot of holes in this class. These are only the first two of many, many to come, so get used to it. Okay, go ahead and remove that part. And we're almost done now. We only have one more hole to drill, but we have to remove some burrs on the edges and on the bottoms of those holes. Believe it or not, the easiest way to do this is just to load a countersink and then jam the part up into it by hand. It comes out pretty good. Although there are still quite a few burrs left on that part. So we'll have to file those off. Just like this. You know, it's kind of easy to hit the outside surfaces, but there are a few surfaces in here that are kind of hard to reach with the file. So if you find that you're having trouble doing it, there is another tool that we can use. It looks kind of like this. It's this sort of three-bladed scraper, and you can use it just like a paring knife to get at difficult-to-reach edges, like these two inside edges here. Just one of many tools at your disposal. And there you go, no more sharp edges. Okay, let's remove all the chips from the, uh, the vice jaws and the parallels. Take those parallels out, clean them up for the next person. Wipe that all off with a shop towel and then also with your hands. We're gonna use some three quarter inch parallels now, a little bit shorter than before. Clean them off, stick them in. And we're going to reorient the part in this sort of vertical orientation here with the tabs on the right side of the vice jaws. So clean off the part, stick it on the parallels, push down, and then tighten the vise. Now you can move the part over so that the drill chuck is sort of over top of the tabs, and then you're going to have to crank the knee all the way back up. Kind of a pain, I admit. Okay, install the edge finder again, and we're going to touch off on the front of the part. And by the way, if the tip isn't wobbling, go ahead and uh, give it a flick with your finger to get it wobbling. It's a lot easier to tell when you're close to the edge that way. And right there. Go ahead and pull the quill up and then zero the y-axis, then move over a hundred thousandths re-zero the y-axis, and now we're going to move to our position, which is 190 thousandths. And now we're located in the correct position in that direction. Okay, now we have to find the center of the tab in the left-right direction. So we're going to use that same trick that we've been using this whole time to find the center of something. So I'm going to touch off on one side, and then pop the quill up, zero the x-axis, move over to the other side, drop the quill back down, find that edge right there, hit the half button and the x-axis button, and then just move to zero. Easy peasy. Take out the edge finder and put in the center drill, and we're going to spot the hole right there. There we go. Take out the center drill, 
and put in the drill, same one we've been using. Okay, now I'm gonna do something a little bit different. I'm gonna drop the quill so that the tip of the drill is touching the top of the surface. And then I'm going to zero the Z axis on the DRO right there. And now I'm gonna drill basically as I did before, going all the way through the top tab, but I'm only gonna go part way through the bottom tab. So the part is one inch 250 thousandths in this direction. So I'm gonna go maybe only one inch 200 thousandths. And that should leave 50 thousandths of material left at the bottom of the hole. All right, go ahead and clean off those chips. Then remove the drill. Countersink goes back in and yeah, we're gonna put another conical enlargement at the mouth of this hole. And measuring over top of it with a dial caliper. And then you're going to have to drop the knee again. <laughs> this is definitely the most labor-intensive part of this project. All right, and then the whole tapping assembly goes back in. A little WD-40, and then you're going to tap just as before, making sure to break the chips every so often like that, and uh, readjust the tap guide as the tap assembles down into that hole. And then back all of that out, get it out of the hole, and then we can take out the part. Beautiful! Look at that! That part is done! Well, at least the mill operations anyway. The part still needs to get bead blasted, and the top surface needs to get lapped, and the PTFE tape needs to be applied. But for this video, we are done. So if you made it this far, congratulations! Give yourself a treat, like a cookie or something. And uh, <laughs> make it too, if this is the first machined part you've ever made. I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.